Okay. So welcome uh, to the Indonesia Project Global Web Seminars on COVID-19. This uh, series is supported by the Australian National University and the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade. Your hosts are myself, Arianto Patunru, Nurkamala Mulyani, and Baskara Adiwena. Today's seminar is on COVID-19 and vulnerable people. We have four distinguished speakers, Dr. Dina Afrianti from Latrobe University, Bapak Selamat Tohari from Universitas Brawijaya, Dr. Sharon Graham Davies from Auckland University of Technology, and Dr. Najma from Universitas Sriwijaya. Dina and, and Slamet are affiliated with the Australian Indonesia Disability Research and Advocacy Network, or IDRAN, and they will talk about the impact of uh, COVID-19 on people living with disabilities, while Sharon and Najma will discuss the complexity of COVID-19 among health workers and the prevention of transmission among children. You are welcome to type in your questions in the Q&A box during the presentation, and we will attend to it in the Q&A session after both presentations have concluded. If you need closed caption, please click the CC button on your screen. So let me now first turn to Ibu Dina to start her presentation. Silakan, Dina. Okay, thank you, Pa Arianto Patunru, and also for the Indonesia Project Team at ANU for the introduction. Uh, um, I think we all appreciate that people with disabilities are among the most vulnerable in society at any time. However, the pandemic highlights the severe vulnerabilities can be increased significantly in time of crisis. This is because policies and systems are already inadequate to meet the needs of people with disabilities and they are now placed under further stress by the crisis. What Slamet and I are going to talk about today is one area on which we focus on in particular higher education sector and how the disruptions of normal access has affected people with disabilities. But before that, allow me to uh, introduce IDRAN to all the audience today. And then I will speak briefly about the policies and then my colleague Slamet will continue to talk about our recent survey on how online teaching affects students with disabilities. So just briefly talking about IDRAN, uh, we started this uh, in 2015 and we formally launched it in 2017. Uh, and host institutions are Brawijaya University and Latrobe University. Uh, we received funding from early on in 2015 and from 2018, uh, we've been supported by Knowledge Sector Indonesia. Sorry, Knowledge Sector Initiative. Uh, a uh, so IDRAN is uh, a voluntary association of disability researchers and advocates based in Australia and Indonesia with a focus on developing awareness of the human rights of people with disability in order to improve policies and services. So uh, our objectives have been to develop capacity in the tertiary education sector in Indonesia relating to disability. We conduct research, uh, to advance knowledge about the lived experience of people with disability, uh, assist governments and also institutions with the development of policies and approaches that advance the rights of people with disability and also conduct research and engage in advocacy to advance the development of socially inclusive policies within Indonesia. We conduct, uh, we have a biannual conferences since 2015 and also we publish publications around disabilities in Indonesia. So I would like to invite everyone here to join IDRAN. You can look at our website and there, there is a section where you can enroll yourself and register to become our member. So we've done uh, uh, recently a disability young advocates training in, in in Malang, in Brawijaya University, supported by the Australia Indonesia Institute. Uh, and also we've done uh, uh, conferences as well, uh, supported by DFED. So why access to tertiary education? 
So if you're looking at the data uh, provided by both government and non-government uh, institutions in Indonesia, you will probably find a quite different numbers of how many people with disability are actually live in Indonesia or they are in Indonesia. And, and, and uh, But we are looking at the national survey data or SUSANAS 2018 and there are about 37 billion Indonesians who are over two years old who live with the different types of disabilities. So that is more than the total population of Australia. Uh, and in Indonesia as well, uh, as, as also as elsewhere in, in the world, I think people with disabilities uh, mostly live in poverty. And one of the key issues, one, one of the key elements of why people with disabilities live in Poverty is because they're lacking access to education and, and therefore they're lacking the access to employment uh, and equal opportunity, opportunity to, pub, to participate in public life. And so that's, that's, that's where we come from. The idea of uh, trying to lift the barriers to access education has been the, the, the background of why we've been working on this sector. Uh, and, 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 and in Indonesia, as you know, many of us probably have understood that you know, segregated school system, the Sekolah Luar Biasa, has been one of the key factors that we think have been uh, affecting the life of people with disabilities because they've been excluding from enjoying quality education and in exploring their utmost, utmost potentials. Uh, and the data from the Ministry of Higher Education Technology uh, in 2017 um, revealed that of the 4,631 tertiary education across Indonesia, there are on, already there are only 152 institutions that had students with disabilities. We have not been able to get any. Uh, 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 any recent data on whether there has been progress in terms of the numbers of students or the numbers of universities that have uh, provided access to students with disabilities. And of the five millions, around five millions, uh, over five millions of students uh, currently, enrolled, sorry, in 2017 enrolled at universities across Indonesia, there are only 401 students with disabilities. So you can see the, the, the gap, the huge gap between uh, people with disability and those who have no disabilities in terms of accessing higher educations. So uh, actually Indonesia has been progressing quite well in terms of policies since uh, it ratified the UNCRPD in 2007 and also uh, um, sorry, uh, signed the, the UNCRPD in 2007 and then um, has, uh, uh, has uh, introduced law uh, disab on disability in 2016 after ratifying the UNCRPD in 2011. And also recently, about three months ago, Indonesian government also introduced government regulation, which actually requires all institutions from early education to higher education to provide reasonable accommodation for students with disabilities. And then uh, the reasonable uh, uh, accommodation government regulation actually uh, stipulates that uh, local uh, sorry, government... Sorry, Dina, sorry yeah. to cut you. Did you mean to share your screen? No, uh, I think I already shared the screen. Uh, sorry. Um, Nuk uh, Baskara, I already sent you the screen. Can you share it? Yep. While waiting for the screen, uh, so yeah, it's, it's on. So for participants, if you would like to uh, still focus on the sign language, uh, you can spotlight uh, the participant who is uh, coded there as sign language interpreter. interpreter. You can uh, choose to spotlight uh, her video. And for other participants, we will uh, spotlight uh, the presentation slides from Dina. So Dina, you can continue, please. Sorry about that. Yeah. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm sorry. Sorry, I have to apologize. I probably speak too quickly. Uh, so I'm sorry for the sign language interpreter. 
So I try to slow down a little bit. Thank you. <laughs> so hang on. So where? Okay. Yes. Yeah. So yeah, Indonesian government has introduced recently the uh, government regulation uh, about three months ago, which actually requires every education providers from early education to tertiary education to provide reasonable adjustments for students with disabilities. Uh, so the reasonable adjustments needs to be guaranteed and needs to be supported by all government levels from national and also uh, regional level. Uh, in particular for tertiary education, it has to be uh, it has to be provided by the Ministry of Higher Education um, to make sure that all universities are providing access uh, to people with disability to quality and uh, quality education. Um, so, so, so the the government regulation requires the government to make sure that it provides financial support to all institutions and also to students with disabilities. They have also, they also need to provide infrastructure and also facilities. Uh, that means all universities needs to make sure that their infrastructure are accessible. And they also need to make sure that, that teachers, educators are well aware of the different needs of people with disabilities and also aware of the technology and also other tools and also equipments that can uh, provide accessibility and also make sure that students can engage and participate during the, the during the, uh, the teaching and learning process. Um, and also, uh, of course, every institution needs to make sure that they have that they introduce inclusive curriculum, which means all educators, lecturers at universities have to understand it, that they need to talk with their students. They need to make sure that their, their, their teaching equipments, their teaching materials are accessible for their students. Um, so how to make a reasonable adjustment? So the reasonable adjustments needs to, for example, uh, provided by university by uh, establishing a unit delayan and disabilities. Some universities have already started to, to work around this area. For example, Brawijaya University and also State Islamic University in Yogyakarta are the two pioneers in terms of providing access to students with disabilities in tertiary education. Uh, and there are other universities slowly catching up like Erlangga University, State Islamic University in Jakarta, University of Indonesia. So, so this unit uh, has been very influential and very important in providing and in making sure that students with disability can have the support they need. Uh, because without that, it will be very difficult for, uh, for the university to ensure that their students who have disability can have the, the quality uh, education that they need. Uh, so, um, so I think uh, what the practice uh, that Brawija University have been uh, doing in the last uh, seven years is worth to be looking at. Uh, and so that's why um, mas, um, uh, my, my colleague Slama Tohari will be talking about this in a few minutes, in a few seconds after this. But um, in terms of how uh, IDRAN has been working to, 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 to understand how students with disability have been affected by the, the, by the sudden change in, in, in this pandemic, uh, we've done a two surveys to look at how teachers uh, from, from primary to secondary education have been working with their students in order to meet the needs of their students with disabilities in using the technology or how they adjust the way they teach uh, using uh, the Zoom, for example, or, or the te other technology that, uh, that will help their students. The other survey that we've been conducted is to look at, to capture the experience of students with disability in higher education. Um, and and Mas, Maslamet will, uh, will discuss about the results of the surveys. 
So I guess that's probably where I should end my presentation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dina. So let's go uh, to Pak Selamat now. Uh, Selamat, over to you. Thank you, Pak Patunyu. So let me share the screen. Okay. Hello, everyone. Thank you for having Injit in this forum and tell, thank you for giving chance to deliver my presentation here in this webinar from Indonesian Project at Australia National University. Thank you, Arianto Patunru, for being a moderator for this really amazing time. So, uh, as has been taught by Mbak uh, Tina Afrianti that I then did uh, sur uh, several survey actually, like three survey related to education during the pandemic COVID-19. So actually, to be honest, that uh, the result of our survey is not totally ready yet to display, but last night I tried to catch and uh, see like the important thing that can be displayed here in Inscursio to, to know for public funding. So, so uh, related to uh, teacher of people with disabilities in uh, basic uh, school, which is elementary, middle, and also high, senior high school, the survey here is that we have 2015 and to 2025 uh, teachers of students with disabilities, which mostly like they have a intellectual disability, blind, deaf, ADHD, double disability, and so forth. So, what are the challenges? What are the challenges, and also what are the difficulties that do they have? Mostly, some uh, of the teachers said that. 26% uh, said that learning facilities are the problem that they have, like technology, channel, computer, they don't have computer, they don't have laptop, they don't have another uh, assistive technology supporting for their learning. That's the crucial thing that, you know, our government should pay attention before uh, they uh, obligate all the school to be online class also. So the second is like lack of support from parents. So parenting issue here, parenting issue is a big problem here because not all parents, people with disabilities are ready to accompany their children and <coughs> coordinating with their school to study online because some of, uh, you know, uh, Parents are also working and they don't have experience in teaching and teaching. That's a big problem in parenting in, during the pandemic COVID-19 in uh, school from home in India, in implementing school from home. So another big number is some of problem like uh, that parent can, cannot handle it, like uh, some of, uh, you know, the student with autism, with ADHD, actually the many parents cannot handle it. Like they, sometimes they have bathroom, something, and yeah. So said that. And other problem is IT literacy. Some of parents they don't know about how to to operate some application like Zoom, Google Classroom, and others. So they have also problem then about the IT literacy. Okay, next is, this is a data that I took from, not from our research, but this is not from Hydran research, I mean. This is from uh, WebQC, which is actually uh, people with disability network. They did a good uh, rapid assessment during this pandemic, which is, can be freely downloaded. <coughs> There's the result side that, Actually, online class is very difficult for students with disabilities. 
So if uh, they said that difficulties is 67 point or 68 percent of most of them are, you know, say that it is difficult to for learning class for online class. So what are the difficulties for students in in high school? I mean, yeah, in higher education, in tertiary education, like uh, we call it mahasiswa. In Ravi Jaya University, we have uh, more than 100 students with disabilities. And we got with many students with disabilities as well. But most of them, here, based on our survey in many places, in uh, universities that have students with disabilities, he said that the most problem that they have is economy during the, in the pandemic. Because some of them, you know, during online class, they need the, uh, they need the, internet connection that we have to, to to buy a credit or we, we call it pool sign indonesia and also we have problem with mobility as well it, you know some of students need to go to to get the, the basic need like food and some other and the public uh, service uh, public transportation and also they need to buy taxi online but it's restricted and also you know the, during the, this COVID-19, it's very restricted and they cannot use it anymore. And there are very significant number also, they feel that having online class is so difficult for them because the situation are different and other patient actually, but I don't know, but they, they said that. So what is aspect of, what is the, what are the aspect that make them difficult in online class so most of them say that no most of them say that the application and platform are not accessible here the data yeah i saw you the data the application and platform are not accessible for students with disability sometimes the lecture you know uh, give the application and also the powerpoint and also the uh, pictures that actually are not uh, accessible for blind student because cannot be hit by uh, screen reading and also the grid number here we can see no sign of some of them are living in rural area so the internet connection are very limited so it's very difficult for them to follow the online class especially who living in rural area or in rural area so the grid number other is Faculty are not ready. So many, the faculties here in are like teachers, lecturers, and also uh, universities and other staff universities. They are not supporting online class for students with disabilities. Sometimes, you know, online class for deaf people, but they're not providing a sign language interpreters. And as well as they speak so fast, for the person who has ADHD and also dyslexia, it's kind of really difficult. So, yeah, it's it's happened that uh, the readiness of faculty of faculties is a big problem. It's a big number in problem as well. And other is that I can say based on our interview and also during our experience in webinar that we did once webinar and also some of the interview that disability awareness related to how to teach people with disabilities is kind of a big problem for our scholars in Indonesia. Some of them are, uh, you know, not aware with disability issues, so they don't know how to teach them with disabilities. Sometimes they give a video with a captioning, sometimes they give a ma material in picture or we got narration so sometimes they talk too fast and others so disability awareness is really important i think here and also no deadline from government even our government didn't provide and also didn't launch and they don't have a standard of how to teach online for students with disabilities i know that some initiative from deaf community, they make a guideline that actually is not from government, but it's from initiative by a deaf student, and then they they give it to our government, to Ministry of Education, and then Ministry of Education took it uh, as a, a standard of how to teach uh, 
student with disability, especially deaf people, how to test students. And other is has been initiated by IDRAN and also Center for Disability Studies. So we are doing that. It's already finished. Actually, tomorrow we'll be sending to uh, our ministry. To I talked to someone in uh, uh, minister that we provide uh, a guideline for how to teach students with disabilities, especially physical disabilities and blind students with disabilities. And no disability support. Actually, some of our students with disabilities are studying at the university that they don't have disability supports. As mentioned by Mbak Dina, that some of our universities already give uh, disability services such as uh, Win Sunan Kalijaga and uh, Unsas Brawijaya, ULM in, in, Banjar, in Banjarmasin, but not all of our universities. If I can tell that only seven to eight universities has, uh, you know, have a disability service. That's, but yeah, yeah. So, but we have a thousand of universities, and so it's really, really only small of number of our university. So the other problem that uh, they have to think in is the economic problem because some of the some of their parents are getting fired by by yeah we call it PHK and also and the payment is the payment the payment for student is not decreasing yet. It's a big issue, some of demonstration and also protest has been done in many places and also become a, a trending topic in Twitter such as Brawijaya Membara, something like that, and also in ITB, also Universitas, uh, I don't know, prestigious something, something in, in Twitter because the students are making a hashtag to protest their universities because some of economy they have an economic problem in their family but the the there is no safe policy or change policy in universities in their university so and it's also impact and to the student of disabilities yeah some of them are coming from a poor family especially people with disabilities and the other is sick now you know, internet connection, not all Indonesian area are covered by internet connection. So it's kind of a big problem. I have an experience when doing a, a you know, scripty, which is a, a thesis, a small minor thesis exam. Some of them are going to uh, Balai Desa, or we call it or in English, uh, what is Balai Desa in English? Uh, center of village, something. Yeah, capital, yeah. capital hall, hall, village hall, okay. city hall, village hall. They go to the village hall to do the exam and to do the dissertation and, and thesis defense. It's really quiet, you know, sometimes. Oh, I would, I can say it's funny, oh, but you know that the, the internet connection is really also crucial problem for Indonesia. So it's also happened to impact to people with disability, especially for students with disabilities who living in rural area. They don't have internet connection. So thank you so much that uh, the result of the research that I can deliver to you. I will thank be you. very delighted to have a question from you all. Thank you, Pak Selamat. Uh, yeah. Thank you again, uh, Budina. So let's now go to uh, uh, Sharon, uh, Sharon, uh, who will co-present with Najma. <laughs> Over to you, Sharon. Hi. <laughs> We've just been talking about internet problems, and oh, okay. <laughs> my colleague Najma is experiencing um, oh. exactly that. So we've just been trying to think creatively. Oh, um, okay. <laughs> We have her on WhatsApp, so we'll just, um, maybe I'll just talk and Najma, you can come in. Okay, uh, so let's, uh, do you want to share your screen or we can share it from 
Okay, Dodi, you share their screen. Can you go to full sc full screen mode, please? Okay. Yeah. So Sharon or Najma, whoever yeah, goes first, go ahead. <laughs> I'll, okay. I'll just, what can I do? Uh, I just mute, I'll just mute Najma for a minute, but I'll hold okay. her up so she can see. Um, <laughs> Uh, Salamat Siang everybody, my name's uh, Sharon Davies and I will be the incoming director of the Herb Feath Centre starting hopefully in two weeks but it's slightly dependent on whether there are any flights. Congratulations Sharon. Um, which at the moment there are not so um, I'll be starting work nonetheless, it just uh, may be a little bit longer before I'm physically physically there. Uh, so Najma and I um, have been working a little bit on COVID-19, looking at vulnerable communities in Indonesia. Today, we're just going to talk very briefly about healthcare workers, um, but I'll say just a few notes on transmission among children particularly because it's been in the media uh, over the last few days. And one of the reports, at least coming out of Australia, has been that there are high numbers of children who are contracting COVID-19 and also who are very sadly dying uh, from the virus. And the statistics I saw this morning were um, I think 160 children have died or have been confirmed uh, to have passed away from COVID-19 in Indonesia. And partly this could be because of general um, uh, lack of health care that children can access, but also other mitigating factors such as potentially lower, um, higher levels of malnutrition and other underlying uh, causes. And the other thing to keep in mind with that is just the low levels of testing uh, for corona uh, in general. Uh, so I uh, will give it a go with Najma to see if she wants to talk through just a couple of these slides. Um, Najma, did you want to say a few words? Yes, please, ma'am. Yes, please, ma'am. Okay, I'll hand it over to you. Okay, ma'am. Okay, please take up me. Oh, if you're I on. This. No, ma'am. Oh, yeah. Okay, thank you very much for and you to invite us to join these activities. So, from these pictures, that there are a lot of assumption or perception in the grassroots that from the government have their own opinion and from the grassroots society have their opinion. For instance. Uh, this is from the government and most social media. They said that this honesty of patients with corona contribute to death of the doctors. In social media, also I observed some of my friends with the health background said that if you don't want to stay at home, we wait for you in the hospital. Or let us health workers stay at home and you just uh, have free go to outside. And other statement that uh, currently viral in the Indonesia, that Indonesia tersera or Indonesia up to you. Uh, next slide, please. So this is the common assumptions that uh, besides the dishonesty of the patient with COVID-19 to help workers, there are some additional perception why how workers are vulnerable to get infected COVID-19. Uh, one of the statements from the uh, head of uh, Association of Doctors in Indonesia said that uh, most of the health workers in hospital uh, or they didn't work in the referral hospital of COVID-19 or most of them got infected uh, because in their personal private practice they may get infected from their patient with asymptomatic condition or they may be exposed to we call it orang tanpa gejala or otg 
So others uh, common assumption says why our cats are vulnerable to got infected the virus is because of neglectance of the use of personal protective equipment because you know that at, at the first stage of the pandemic in the early of February our government still said that we are free of the corona so there is no good communication for the society why while at the time uh, I have my exam my doctoral exam in New Zealand so it's so different in New Zealand everything is clear communication when we can stay at home when uh, they said that if you are not well stay at home and call the doctors so it's very clear in New Zealand but in Indonesia it's not clear and we tend to denial there is possibility of COVID in Indonesia and other uh, possibility that uh, the tiredness of health workers that the decrease of the immunity we know that some health workers should do uh, self isolation so other health workers should back up their work and lack of personal protective equipment we don't imagine that every province in indonesia like jakarta who have uh, a lot of uh, testing and a lot of uh, equipment for the health workers we have remember we have disparities of health workers and the availability of equipment next slide please so how about the perceptions of the grassroots or society that spreads in community and the in the screen there is uh they call that uh sebut covid 19 so call covid 19 as a business of doctor so the gossips of hard workers make money with covid 19 are uh rampant in indonesia and no one control about that and they said that Further diagnosis of tests need money. The burial of COVID-19 patients with special treatments also need money. So additionally, interesting that not all society believe that their family, if they are, they are hospitalized in a hospital with COVID-19, they are infected with COVID-19. They got uh, hypertension, not COVID-19. They got, uh, they got, uh, heart attack not COVID-19 they seek the treatment because of they have accident not COVID-19 so there is a denial from society that their family could be uh, get infected with COVID-19 and during my field work it's interesting that uh, some people say that in a suburban area or we call it in Kampung that what they still remember is the information that the government spread two months ago that the risk factors for a patient with COVID-19 that for those who have travel history from overseas or they go from Mudik we call or move from province to other province and they believe that the society surrounding them is a good person who didn't do that so they are not vulnerable to COVID-19. Next slide please. This is what the response of the early pandemic that the government announced the first two cases of COVID-19 in the early of March. You know that what I learned that from my social media that my friends post a lot of things about how how workers resilience to protect themselves from COVID-19 and they use raincoat or just hujan to protect themselves because at the time there is a lack or shortage of protective uh, equipment for them and the expensive uh, price for the mask and everything and it's interesting they are creative they have idea we need to protect ourselves either we just buy the raincoat with our own money next slide please uh, six weeks after the early of pandemic one of my friend posted uh, these uh, pictures and I asked her permission to use these pictures and she posted on the Facebook that she said very happily that this is uh, the most ever complete protective personal equipment that she has ever used so in the early of May and it is the donation from the society so it's interesting how the health governments say their aspiration government we need equipment 
we want to treat the patient, but we need to protect our own self first. Next slide, please. So, move to the global view. Why? Health workers are vulnerable to COVID-19. Uh, we believe that most people understand either in Indonesia and worldwide that it's a high priority to protect the nurse and doctors because they are the front line to protect a lot of patients. Particularly in Indonesia, we have very shortage number of the health workers. And based on the data worldwide, that over 90,000 health workers got infected COVID-19 and more than 1,000 of them have passed away with the health, uh, health profession with different type of professions, doctors, specialists, nurse, and other types. And we believe that failure to recap both infection rates and deaths among health workers is putting more risk not only for health workers but also their patients are in danger and it's interestingly if you want to find how many percent health workers got infected in Indonesia it's just oh it's not easy to find the data next please so what lesson that we can learn from other countries uh, previous study that believe that anxiety depressions are happen among health workers during the pandemic and this condition can decrease the immunity of health workers and previous research also believe that have proved that personal protective equipment used in the right ways can decrease the infection of risk however Certain exposures, such as like the involvement of intubations or direct contact to the patient, were associated with the increased risk to get infected COVID-19. And what I can learn about the openness of the data in our neighboring country, such as Malaysia, they said that among health, they, they, they are possibility that health workers got infected COVID-19, but they state very clearly that. 70% of health workers in Malaysia got infected not because of they have close contact, but it's around 30% of them, but 70% of them may got infected the virus because of the private activities such as attending events or going abroad and such as. So they can be honest with the what happened with, with in Malaysia, whether is it, is it true we, sh we just did the blame the patient who make health workers vulnerable to other patients. Next, please. So we come with our concerns of research there. So what we want with the scarcity of the data uh, in Indonesia, particularly for me as epidemiology and statistician, but during my PhD, uh, my supervisors uh, convert me to be qualitative research. So we want to understand what is the complexity of COVID-19 among health workers in Indonesia. So we did qualitative approach. So we analyzed the statement of related to the cases from the online news media, Instagram, Facebook. Most of the data on the news is the information from the workplace of the doctors or the family members or the association health association provisions and we did a thematic analysis and at this time we still uh, deliver the initial findings because uh, we we still need a lot of discussion about this with uh, the groups of our research next please so what we can learn so today we will present three cases that we have explored from the the news about the cases. I call it cases A. Uh, he got, uh, he passed away with the status of suspected uh, COVID-19 or patient dalam pengawasan. So he is a professor of a famous uh, university in Indonesia. One of uh, his daughter tell the story about him and it's a spread widely on the social media how he may 
got infected H uh, uh, sorry COVID-19 from his patients and he believed that the patient that her father treated should go to further treatment for COVID-19 but she felt anger because the patient decided not to, to, to follow the direction of his father and make his father pass away due to the close contact with the patients. And interestingly, the dedicate, this dedicated professor still teaching online three days before he passed away. Fortunately, the university where the, the case A taught has regulation that every subject should be online one week uh, before the professor uh, give the lesson to online. And one of the spider web that I can learn that case A may infect his college. We call it case B in the same university and in the same department because they have uh, a meeting one week before case A passed away and her friend also passed away one week after case A uh, case B passed away one week after case A passed away so there is a there is a family anger toward the patient with suspected COVID and also there is a family disappointment uh, that why my father left alone in isolation when he needs a ventilator because he suffered from the shortness of breath, but he left alone and he just called the, the daughters and no one came and it's just a missed opportunity to, to save this one professor. Next, please. The, so it, this is how about we learn to other cases. Is it really uh, health workers, all health workers got infected from their patients? From case C, I call it, this is a young medical doctor, the age still, still around 35 years old, also, and he didn't have a comorbid, comorbidity history or other diseases like diabetes, hypertension. And some of the news we analyzed that, and the statement from the Dinas Kesehatan or a public health office in in the the kabupaten in the regency where he worked that he may got infected covid 19 due to uh he 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 a uh, doctor and he treated his parents both father who also a nurse and mothers a wife and they also have passed away due to the with the suspected covid 19 and Unfortunately, due to the late announcement of the result of COVID-19, uh, case C may also infect seven of his college in Puskesmas or community health centers and the place that he works. So it's, and also he, he may infect his wife and his baby and also the babysitter of his child. So it's a complex uh, spider web that we can learn from uh, from Casey. Uh, and she, he passed away recently. Next, please. And what we can learn from another cases, I call it Case D. Uh, he's a medical doctor and with the age of over 40 years, uh, 50 years old, and based on the analysis of the data that we got from the news that he may got infected HIV because of the travel history because uh, he has a travel history to Batam, one of the epicentrum of COVID-19 in the end of the March. And besides that, he also have other diseases that, uh, eat, that make her health more deteriorate. And Interestingly, interestingly, that the initial diagnosis of this cases is dengue fever, because in some regions, particularly in some rural areas, in the early of pandemic, we should uh, we should send the 
the laboratory test to the Jakarta. So it takes time to know whether the patient really COVID-19 or other diseases. And he, he passed away and he also infected his wife and his wife is uh, still alive now. Uh, the result of the COVID-19 of these patients is out one week after he passed away. Next, please. So what we can learn from understanding of these cases? Sarin, you want to continue? Sharon, do you want to continue? Maybe you okay. can just go ahead, Najma. Oh, uh, sorry. Oh, yeah. there we go. Yeah, no, I just had my mic off and then my okay. mouse couldn't couldn't go. Um, maybe we could just go to the um, conclusion and leave some more time for questions. Yes, the next slide for the conclusions. One more. Next One slide. more, Dodi. Yes. Yeah, so I could probably um, sum up. So I think one of the important things to take away from Najma's research is um, that there's a lot of shame and stigma around declaring uh, COVID-19, but of course this is making it more difficult than for healthcare workers to be able to adequately treat patients. Um, so work needs to be done to make sure pe people feel able and safe and secure uh, to disclose uh, symptoms of COVID-19 and to have those uh, discussions um, and, and in that way um, healthcare workers can be kept more safe and, and we heard in Najma's talk that um, a lot of deaths have happened because people have had the shame and stigma of, of declaring COVID symptoms and I think if we look just at the last um, slide there Najma didn't have time to talk today but she's also been doing a lot of work with children um, and passing on information to them so they understand the importance of the stay home imperative washing hands uh, and face mask wearing so there's a nice photo that we could end with on the last slide if you just click forward once more Dodi, one yes. yeah 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 so we can just end uh, there and save some time uh, for questions. All right. Thank you so much, uh, Najma and Sharin. Um, so let's go to question and answer. I don't see question from Q&A, but um, you can also raise your hand if you want to ask question. I don't see. I'd quite like to start with a question if I could. Yes, sure. Uh, maybe just for our other two speakers, just in terms of, I mean, this is a fabulous job here. We've had closed caption um, subtitles at the, the bottom of the screen and a fabulous sign language interpreter. Thank you very much. I was just wondering how for different groups in Indonesia, has the COVID-19 information been conveyed? Dina, do you want to take that? Uh, yes, yeah, thank, thanks, Sharon, for the questions. Uh, that's actually uh, one of the things that we've been trying to work on uh, because uh, access to information is one of the biggest challenges, especially for people with disabilities, in terms of first, how to understand what COVID-19 is what the virus is, is how it spreads and how they might be contracted. And, uh, and, and at the very early on, uh, I think up until first four to six weeks, there have been no attempts met, the, met by the government in order to ensure that people with disabilities understand what is going on. And the fact that the different type of disability requires different types of uh, in paying the information requires different tools, different equipments, different platform, different formats of information. Then what we did is we post on our uh, social media and also in our uh, website. If you go to our website, you will see there's a COVID-19 tab in there where we 
uh, when we uh, post uh, about um, what is COVID-19 in sign language and also with, with the closed captioning uh, in order to, for people with disability understand what's going on. But again, uh, the different types of disability requires different platforms. Uh, for the blind people, they need to, because in their everyday lives, some of them need someone to accompany them or that they use a, a stick, for example, how do they make sure that they, they're not their sticks or they other, uh, uh, the, the other assistive tools that they use are contracted or getting the virus. Uh, and also with deaf people, for example, uh, because information on televisions are not accessible, they don't provide sign language interpreter on the screen. But eventually, I think some of the uh, young disability advocates uh, from Indonesia, uh, they, 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 you know, did this advocacy. They first talked to the government, hey, you need to make sure that we, uh, we cannot understand what's going on. So you need to make sure it's your job it's your obligation and so and 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 only later on for example uh, the the government use sign language interpreter in in all their press conferences but again uh that are still not uh widely uh, accessible and so yeah that's that's some of the things that we've been doing um um yeah and and we also share all the information to to the local government, for example, in Malang, in 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 West, in East Java, on how they need to make sure that all information, not just about the COVID-19, not just about the virus, but also what policies that the government has been uh, introduced uh, are also conveyed or uh, uh, accepted by people with disabilities. So they are not going to be missed out from Bantuan Social on, and from other, other types of uh, policies that the government has uh, introduced. So maybe Amex can also add. Selamat. Pak Selamat, do you have something to add to that? Yeah, so for the people with disabilities in Indonesia, so the government actually didn't pay attention to the kind of... Disability. Can you speak louder, please? The, the government actually did not pay attention to, to for this group especially for the blind people mostly sometimes they their website and also their platform you know they deliver the information in picture and also in uh, gpg which is actually not we can cannot be read by film reader actually the blind student and also blind people have a software to read so uh, to read in internet they use a software like uh, like jaws and others, but in picture they cannot read it. Yeah, so that we okay. need narration, we need facts, not only picture. Okay, thank you. I see uh, two hands raised. Uh, first one is uh, Peter Mokoli and then Weni Wandasari, and then there will be uh, there is a question also from Q and A that I will read later on. So, can I ask pa Peter uh, to go first? Uh, uh, can you? Uh, am I coming across? You can hear me, uh, Pa Acho? Yes, I can hear you, Pa. But if you can speak a bit louder, that would oh, be great. Okay, uh, okay, I'll try. Okay, terima kasih. Yeah. I have a question to uh, Pa. I think it's to Pa Slamet Kalosaidi de Sala, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, he, there, there was a discussion uh, in the first uh, presentation about Peraturan uh, Pemerinta, I think it was, a government regulation, Nomor Tigablas, number 13 of Town Dua Pulu Dua, Dua Ribu Dua Pulu, number 13 uh, of the current year, about providing, uh, if I'm not mistaken, it was about providing facilities to for a reasonable education for disabled person, people. I, I hope I've got that detail correct. My, my, my question is, is about funding. Um, it, it, it's all very well, I guess, to put out a Paraturan Pamarinta, but uh, there has to be funding for it. Uh, was, was, can you tell us anything about the funding? Did the, the government also provide some funding or was it assumed that the Pamarinta uh, Daira, the, the local government, the provincial government or the local governments would provide the funding? And if so, 
uh, was that a reasonable assumption? So, uh, Paul Kochnia, I mean, can you can you tell us a little bit about funding? Terima kasih, Thank you, Pak Peter. Yeah. Thank you, Pak. Uh, let's take another question uh, from Bu Weni. Silakan, Weni. Hello, can you hear me clearly? Yes. Yeah. Um. Uh. I wanna ask for the uh, to the second speakers. So I didn't hear much about the findings about uh, the prevention of transmission uh, among the children. Uh, can you please tell uh, me more about uh, the findings on that topic? Okay, thank you. Uh, Pak Selamat, can you comment on Pak Peter's question yeah. about funding? Ah, okay, Pak Haryanto. Thank you, Pak Peter, for your question. It's a really challenging question. Yeah, I try to answer my best. So actually in our regulation, uh, so the new regulation, Keputusan Menteri, the, per, the PP, Peraturan Pemerintah is actually derived from uh, our Undang-Undang uh, Regulation, which is Undang-Undang uh, number 8, 2016, which is actually that the local government and also uh, university uh, should provide uh, disability services for uh, people with disabilities and also for students with disabilities. And so the the peraturan perintah, peraturan pemerintah which is actually uh, like technical thing to do to, to implement the undang-undang is uh, that regulate that uh, the funding and the budget is uh, uh, obligate to universities and as well as its school is for uh, uh, local government, local government, because local government also should provide the disability support for students with disability. So that, yeah, about the funding, but about the funding for scholarship, I think the government had paid attention for scholarship, which is called as uh, Misi. Missile is actually uh, objective for people who living in treaty, terpinggir, ter ter marginal, ter something like that. I don't know. I, I forget the three treaty, ter marginal, ter uh, something like that. So, and um, since two years ago, our government paid attention and give allocation for BTPC for people with disabilities. So they got like uh, some percent of people with disabilities to get scholarship. It's fully popular, it's fully uh, uh, scholarship and they got like uh, 600,000 every month and also free of taltation before. Yeah, that's what I can answer. And lucky us that our some of our students from coming from uh, low class, they got this scholarship. That, but they have to get to, into the university because after that they enroll to the, this scheme of, scheme of scholarship. Yeah. Thank, Thank you, you Pak Selamat. Uh, Sharon, do you want to respond to the second question about transmission among uh, children? This is also, uh, I think, the same uh, with the question from Cynthia Hunter from Q&A. So go ahead. Yeah, please. so there's two. Uh, questions also on the, the Q&A there and I'll, I'll let Najma speak more fully because she's done some amazing uh, work in terms of creating songs that encourage children to do those simple things such as washing your hands for how long you should wash them um, and where there's limited water you know a, a little bit of water on your hands and then soak them up uh, a lot and then rinse them off uh, the importance of wearing masks the importance of social distancing um, and also staying home where, wherever that is possible. And just in terms of the question on the risk for children, the research is still very um, undecided about that. It looks like children have a very low risk of um, both transmitting the, uh, the virus and uh, being uh, impacted by it. But in Indonesia, there is not very much data that is age 
disaggregated. So the data doesn't necessarily tell us what the age of victims are, for instance. So much more research needs to be done um, on that. Uh, but I think Najma will be far more informed than me and can give some um, actual in context examples. So I'll hand over to her if she can. Najma, are you still there? Can you comment on that? Okay. Okay, thanks. Okay. Uh, thank you very much, Sharon. Uh, we did uh, educations for three weeks with over 80 children in the suburban area. So most of them have parents from middle and low income. So it's Swasana like Kampung, so it's uh, rural areas. And it's initially that quite challenging if although we already provide free masks, and we also provide a presence if they use masks for weeks or two weeks because we have some donors provide that. They said that we cannot breathe. It's too hot. You know that we play kites, so we need to run. So it's, it's it, the first two weeks, they still use masks or they put on the neck. So they just ensure it because uh, I also involved the teachers uh, surrounding them to do social surveillance on their behaviors. Uh, some teachers say that uh, kids are happy to use face feel rather than mask because it's very difficult for them to play and run and to use masks. And some of the knowledge of the kids for COVID-19 is so amazing. They saw, when we ask, do you know COVID-19? Yeah, it will be someone what mati. It can make people pass away. It's dangerous. It's virus. Uh, but they still in the knowledge, so it's it's we believe that education is slow, so it will take time for their understanding. Uh, unfortunately, with the policy of the government that introduced the new normal life, and for the kids that they didn't see the virus, and they see that my friends are fine for three months without the mask, so they think that the virus already go to sky, so it's already finished. So. It's quite challenging to ensure them that, that the virus is surrounding them. And one of the parents interestingly said that how, how they explained to me that Najma kids, they didn't believe what they didn't see because the virus, they cannot see. But if I explain to my kids, you have to use masks because the police, otherwise, the police will catch you. Uh, so they're very afraid and they, they will use masks. So we should understand the kids' point of view, not the adults. We force the kids to use masks. We, we should understand that education is slow and it takes time. And within the, uh, the, the, this condition with the local transmission, we need to find tactics from the parents how to encourage the kids the to kids use the mask. So it's very interesting. Thank you so Thank much, you. Uh, Najma. Um, next is, I'd like to invite Rochelle Quigin uh, to raise her question directly and perhaps Pat Terry Hall, if, you, if you're there, Pat Terry. So Rochelle. No, uh, so let's uh, ask uh, Pak Terry and then I will just, I think, yeah, Pak pa Terry. Thank you, yes. Uh, okay. A, a great uh, coverage of the problems faced in Indonesia. Uh, in Australia, we have been discussing the outbreaks in Melbourne, which have been associated with uh, populations that are not fluent in English. And there's been some discussion that there should be uh, materials uh, translated into uh, the language of migrants. I'm wondering what Indonesia is doing with over 1,000 languages. Uh, and although Bahasa Indonesia is a very widespread, uh, there are many people who are still not very fluent in Bahasa Indonesia and who rely on local languages. Uh, what is happening with the uh, materials that are prepared at the national level for distribution throughout the archipelago? Thank you, Pat Terry. Let's take another question from uh, Johannes Windy. 
Silakan, Pak. Johannes? No. Okay. Okay. Um, we have seen a lot of victims come from the medical workers uh, uh, dealing with the COVID-19. So, and there are so many uh, campaigns, uh, health education, how to um, to to prevent the transmission of the infections. But um, I just wondering uh, in Najma um, studies, maybe she found something interesting. Why why the, the transmission of the COVID is a big enough for the medical workers? Because if you compare with the others others uh, um, uh, strategy like uh, physical distancing, wearing protective gears and uh, everything. I think those medical workers are there well now, well known about those uh, procedures, but why still, still the number is still high and maybe there's uh, something unique, something you're know, not covered. The, the transmission still happen among the health workers. Thank you. Thank you, Pat Johannes. So back to the speakers, maybe either Sharin or Najma on the language, on the translation, the local language. Do you want to comment on that? Sharin? Not... Okay, me. Yes. Hello? Yes. Uh, it's interestingly that how the bureaucracy in uh, Indonesia that uh, from Ministry of Health, then uh, public health offices, or Dinas Kesehatan Kota. So initially, some of the materials are adopted adopted from Ministry of Health. So mostly using Bahasa Indonesia or Indonesian language. So some of the public health centers uh, try to make the posters based on their languages. And one of the organization that I involved, that public health organization. Uh, later, maybe uh, admin can share that I share on the Facebook about uh, on the WhatsApp group about the sum of posters. So, how the Sriwijaya University and the alumni of Public Health Association uh, engage uh, students and alumni of Public Health to create uh, posters with local languages. So, this is example of uh, we call it Jago Jara is a. Uh, uh, keep a physical distance, so in Bahasa Indonesia. So we work together with the students and we adopt it to in our languages. And also we share to the society surrounding us later. Uh, I'll... Okay. And also the second, and also we move to share the mask, the, put the poster in Kampung, and we involved local uh, young organization to help us to spread the, 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 the posters. And also uh, students of public health faculty in Sriwijaya University spread the video that they made. So because I'm lecturer, so some of my friend lecturers. So uh, most of our students stay at home. So we just make a challenge for them to share, to make the video with the local language where they all come from. And we share to their social media, Facebook, Instagram. That's the efforts that we can do from the public health faculties, Rija University. And secondly, why health, health, health workers are vulnerable to COVID-19? Sherry, do you want to explain about it? Yeah, I'm, you're far more better place. But um, yeah, just to say that just the everyday involvement um, with community members and it's very difficult even in the best equipped society uh even having the mask on you must take it off at some point and and where it goes um is also a risk of transmission so just by putting themselves at the very front line uh is incredibly risky and i just saw earlier today someone uh, a healthcare worker in the us really pleading with people to stay home uh, so on the one hand, people saying that they should have a right to go out and to socialise, but the people that they're really putting at risk are the healthcare workers who then have to go and deal uh, with the increased number of cases. So just by being on the front line, not having the proper protective equipment, and we saw on Najma's slide there that healthcare workers in Indonesia needing to resort to just everyday raincoats, thin pieces of plastic, 
um, that makes it, you, they can't protect very well from COVID-19. The lack of other resources such as having adequate soap, having adequate water, all of these things contribute to make it really difficult to keep oneself safe if they're on the front line of dealing with a lot of people. Thank you, Sharon. Dina, in your uh, advocacy work, do you also um, find these challenges in terms of local languages? They don't speak Bahas Indonesia and things like that. Can you share your experience? Uh, yeah, I think, um, well, it's Najba had mentioned it uh, earlier, early on, and and I think in the first few weeks, I think it was not the government who had the initiative to try to make sure that everyone, including those who are not uh, speaking Bahasa Indonesia, understand what uh, the virus is. And so, for example, some local organizations and also including Muslim-based organizations, I think, including Muhammadiyah and Nahdlatul Ulama, they've also been working in trying to fill that gap um, uh, to make sure that their the information are widely shared uh, in the community on languages. So, for example, I understand also government in West Sumatra and also in West Java, they also uh, uh, posted or, or shared videos uh, and shared it on WhatsApp. And, and I think WhatsApp has been very, very important, very influential, very helpful in order to for people to understand what's, uh, what's the virus is and including information how they can prevent themselves to be uh, uh, contracted by the virus. Um, I was just uh, trying to mention also here, probably again uh, on our website, on IDRAN website, we have very early on um, created an information about how uh, you know, uh, hospitals and also healthcare, health, health facilities uh, need to make sure that they understand how, you know, if there are people with disabilities get contracted, how the best way to approach them and, and that to make sure that hospitals also have uh, all the necessary informations in, in, you know, if it is printed materials, then it should be in braille or, you know, so a nurses also, because that, this is also something that probably worth to be researched. On, uh, on the on how uh, how aware nurses, uh, doctors, and also uh, para other paramedics uh, engage with people with disabilities. Do they understand sign language, for example, uh, or how if there are uh, people with disabilities who cannot come to the to the hospitals or to the healthcare facilities due to the lack of infrastructure? Uh, will they, you know, come to their houses? Will they approach them? So this is the area that needs to be also researched. Uh, and also, uh, I think we've, we've, we've shared that kind of information uh, in order for, for, for health facilities to understand how they must approach uh, and, and must protect people with disabilities because of the different type of disabilities and also the health conditions that uh, people with disabilities might have. Yeah. Thank you so much, uh, Dina. I saw a very interesting observation from Kerry Hung from Singapore, NTU. Can I invite Kerry to share her observation? Kerry? Okay, hi. So, um, can everyone hear me? Yes, okay, please. Okay, that's good. So, um, uh, so, in Singapore, just sharing about how uh, information has been transmitted to our very small Singapore population. Um, so the government has this centralized WhatsApp service that um, all locals, anyone with a WhatsApp account in Singapore can uh, sign up for, so including foreigners. Um, and uh, it sends out daily specific updates on COVID-19 to, uh, to everyone who subscribes to the service. So uh, WhatsApp, I believe, has been quite uh, widely used and it's also very uh, accessible because most people use smartphones. Uh, um, and it's also accessible via JAWS software or equivalent for the visually impaired and also how I believe even in Indonesia, um, in the village areas like the kampongs, um, people also use WhatsApp quite a lot and social media. So I think that 
uh, perhaps this information, like this sharing on how the Singapore government has been uh, transmitting information would be useful. And this WhatsApp service is also available in four languages. So Singapore has four official languages, English, Mandarin, Bahasa, Malayu, and Tamil. So um, uh, we can choose to subscribe to whichever language works for us. Although this is not perfect because we also have many people who speak dialects. We have the aging population. We have the elderly who do not use smartphones. They uh, don't know how to use the internet. They have no internet access. So there's also some digital divide over here. But um, in terms of information transmitting, at least uh, anyone with a smartphone uh, with WhatsApp will be able to access these government messages uh, yeah, so I hope that this sharing has useful uh, information for everyone. Thank you. Thank you so much. I don't see other hands. Oh, Ro Rochelle, are you there? I don't think Rochelle is uh, there. Oh, yes. Go ahead. Um, okay. I, was, I was just interested to know if there's been any specific focus on the effects of COVID-19 in West Papua with the the challenges of conflict as well. Okay, um, anyone wants to respond to this? Uh, Najma, you have, a... go ahead. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, it's interesting that uh, Papua have a policy of lockdown. So uh, where, where other people didn't do that, but uh, he did at the first stage of lockdown of the area at the first, uh, in the early of Pandemic. So it's interesting how they protect, they know that their location is far away from the central of Indonesia and it's quite difficult to send the equipment, protective equipment and ATC. And for the conflict areas, and Sharon could add about it, but for the transportation of uh, personal equipment, it's quite challenging because we need uh, what we call a Sharon soldier plane. Uh, to, to send everything there and some of the nations also sh uh, share it to the Papua. And about the conflicts here, you can add it? How the challenging Papua with the conflicts about health. Yeah, I, I mean, I could, I know just, bit about I could just add that, um, I mean, the difficulties across Indonesia in terms of accessing medical health care, um, protective equipment have been quite difficult. and. That will be just much worse in uh, Papua and West Papua, um, where in the best of times, access to medicine, to medical services, to local hospitals are very stretched. And with the Indonesian government prioritising where particular healthcare goes, uh, it's pretty fair to say that it won't be uh, to West Papua. And, and of course, it's not just that people will increasingly have COVID in West Papua and, and we don't have reliable statistics on that and they're going inevitably to be much higher than those reported. But also what is happening is that any healthcare that gets directed to West Papua um, will also mean that it's drawn away from other essential medical services. So we've seen already quite deeply increasing rates of dengue, of malaria, uh, and HIV, of course, all of the limited services that used to go into providing care uh, for those illnesses will now be pulled out um, of treating dengue and, and malaria and HIV and pushed into COVID care. Uh, so it's not just that West Papua will have limited resources for dealing with COVID, those limited resources will also be pulled out of other areas, um, child, uh, infant mortality, maternal mortality, for instance, are also going to be uh, much worse. Thank you, uh, Sharon and Najma. There is a question, maybe this is the last question, from um, Avery Gaylor from La Latrobe. Um, despite the issues Pak Selamat raised, could online teaching make higher education more accessible for people living with disability in the long run. Uh, Salamat, your uh, comment? Ajo, Ajo, sorry, can we yes. please ask uh, take question from Ibu Nino Pambudi? Is there Ibu Nino? Okay, yes, Ibu Nino, uh, while um, waiting for uh, Pak Salamat to respond to that question, can we hear Ibu Nino? Silakan Ibu Nino, apa kabar Bu? 
uh, uh, baik Pak. <laughs> uh, actually, I've written my question here. I, I have only one question to Dina and Slamet. Uh, yes, yeah, since the government will soon open the activity back to normal, new normal. So, how will the situation with the students with uh, as disabilities will the situation get better for the students or um, I don't know. Uh, 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 maybe Dina and Slamet uh, can explain about that. Thank you. Thank you, Ibu. Silakan mungkin. Uh, maybe we we start with Slamet and then Dina. Go ahead. Okay. Uh, actually, oh, before that, thank you, Ibu Nini, for the question. Actually, the 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 school is not open yet, so. Our government minist uh, ministry of education still run the online class until the end of the year. So even though that uh, government uh, said that we start new normal life, but I think school is not open yet for all public, especially for basic school like elementary, student high school, uh, senior high school, and middle school. I think that my question. So. They still use online teaching, but online learning. Yeah, uh, Dina. Uh, yeah, I think uh, probably Mas Amex, you can also uh, answer Avril's question uh, later on. But I I'll probably just jump in quickly. Uh, yeah, that that's actually a, a very good point because. Uh, with this pandemic and that everything moves online, uh, they they very early on there was a you know a lot of discussion that actually this this should open everyone's eyes that uh, people with disabilities should uh, be given the opportunity, for example, to involve in the employment because everyone now works from their home and uh, and that's exactly has been the the problem in, in before pre COVID that people with disability cannot get employment because of the lack of access in terms of their mobilities. And so that means if they can't go to work, then mean that won't be able to get into employment. The same thing with they, they, if they can't go to schools, they can't get access to education. And the whole thing with COVID-19, with everyone is moving online. So the questions that, you know, this, this has been, um, even among us researchers, we've talked about like, this is actually an opportunity for government and also education institutions to think about how, uh, including people with disability into education can uh, be done by, by online. But again, the questions will be, uh, the idea of including Inclusive education is to put everyone in the same in the same room, for example, so that uh, for sure uh, among people with disability, with those who have no disability, can uh, um, can be there. Uh, that will be the questions. But I think uh, for at the moment, probably uh, also relating to the the next question from Ibuninu. Uh, I think uh, online education probably is the best, the best, the best thing for people with disability, uh, unless unless the government and also uh, schools and also university make sure that uh, they can prevent and they can protect uh, students with disability not to get uh, um, contracted by the virus. But if that cannot be done, then probably. Uh, you know, making sure that uh, technology and also other assistive technology can be provided for students with disability. That's probably uh, should be maintained until everything else can be done. Thank you so much. I think you also uh, addressed the question from Avery already about the long long run uh, trend of this online uh, teaching. So our time is up. Uh, I'd like to thank all the speakers. Uh, Dina, uh, Selamat, Sharon, Najma, thank you so much. I thank all the participants and my team, uh, Nuka and Dodi. And also, of course, last but not least, our uh, sign language interpreter, uh, Nisrina and Arum, and also our uh, closed captioner, uh, Mas Dimas. So thank you so much, and I'll see you next time. 
Anuka. Bye. Thank you. Thank you so much for uh, everyone. Thank you, Pak Acho. Thank you, Nuka and Mas Askara for. Thank you, Pak Arum, and thank you, Mbak Nisa. Ina, Ina, Nis, Rina. Okay. Dan Mas Kima. Ya, Sama-sama. Thank you, Nisa, Mbak. Thank you. Thank you. I just want to say that. Um, thank you, everyone. I just want to say that we won't have a seminar next week. We'll take a break for a week, and then we get we'll see you again the week after. Thanks. And I'm going to close this seminar. Bye. We did well, even in like very last minute. We have sign interpreter and also captioner, but it's great. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much.